Hey everybody, welcome to MSP Mountain. My name is Eric from Support Adventure, and today we are joined by Devin from eBridge Marketing. And uh, we also have uh, Tal Online, who's our marketing strategist at Support Adventure and had some marketing wisdom to this. And um, yeah, Devin, so you provide uh, marketing services uh, to MSPs, which is relevant to MSP Market, um, MSP Mountain. So we wanted to have you on so you could tell us more about that and uh, just sort of like uh, tell us how it works and how you can up the game for marketing for MSPs. So welcome. Well, thanks so much, Eric. It's a real pleasure to be with you, with you guys here today. And, um, you know, it's, it's morning for me. I know it's evening for you guys and I appreciate you making the time for me. No worries. No worries. Um, so... Yeah, why don't you give us like the sort of basic elevator pitch of eBridge marketing and how can up the game on MSP marketing? Yeah, you bet. So eBridge Marketing Solutions, we are a marketing agency and we focus on IT service providers. And we've been around for about 20 years and actually started off more with the web hosting industry um, and over the years have, have evolved into other types of IT service providers. And these days we work with a lot of MSPs and that's our main target market. And I'm the VP of operations with eBridge. I've been with the company for about nine years. So, you know, I've been, uh, I've really seen the industry evolve and I've seen kind of what works for a whole bunch of different companies, what doesn't, um, and, uh, you know, how that's kind of changed over the years as well. And how did your um, journey with eBridge sort of like um, over the last nine years sort of change your marketing approach? Like where, where did you start on the whole game and where have you evolved as digital marketing evolved and all that sort of stuff? Yeah, it's actually been very interesting because there has been drastic changes in the market. Um, when I started off nine years ago, a big focus of ours was really on advertising, like digital advertising, specifically like banner ads. And um, and also affiliate marketing was a big thing back then, and, and maybe a little bit more so on the web hosting side of things. But, um, you know, over the years, because of privacy changes, uh, because of changes in, in the law, um, you know, uh, to do with uh, affiliate marketing and disclosures and things like that. We've really seen a decline in, in like the effectiveness of digital advertising. And there are some exceptions that we can get into. But if we're talking about like the old days where you would say uh, approach a website that had to do with, with MSPs um, and you would, you know, get a direct ad buy with them, you know, you'd have banner ads showing up on their website and you'd get, you know, X amount of impressions. Um, you know, those days are really behind us. They're not really uh, a strong uh, um, tactic for a lot of MSPs. Um, and you know, that's just been a really big change because, uh, you know, the focus has completely changed to more of a, um, what I would describe as kind of a, a content uh, or SEO focused um, uh, tactics that those tend to be what works these days. Um, and another really big change is just a decline in measurability. Um, we've seen over the years that it, it just, it, it's becoming harder and harder to measure marketing. Um, you know, there's, it goes back to privacy changes. And recently, um, you know, Facebook was, was a big one where, um, you know, Facebook used to give you a lot more targeted uh, um, uh, granular measuring um, and, and you, you know, could use cookie tracking and things like that. Um, cookies, you know, are becoming less and less common just because they are being blocked by default. Um, so that just poses a lot of challenges for, for measuring marketing. Um, and it's particularly relevant for MSPs due to the longer sales cycle um, and the complicated uh, sales process that MSPs tend to have. And I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here, but, you know, with MSPs, you have multiple decision makers, uh, you know, uh, who are deciding on, on, on what uh, MSP to go with. They could be in different offices. Um, so, you know, a stereotypical example is maybe, you know, maybe there's an, an IT manager who finds out about uh, your MSP uh, from a blog post, let's say, and maybe they share that blog post with, you know, a financial person in the company who's in a different office um, and, you know, they shared it by email or whatever. Well, going and trying to track that first interaction with the blog and then, you know, um, and tracking that back to the actual decision maker who makes the, that purchase in the, another office it's essentially impossible. Um, so, you know, it, it used to be a lot more direct. It used to be simpler with fewer decision makers, um, but uh, it's just becoming, um, it's becoming more complicated as, you, you know, even like C-suite becomes more aware of things like cybersecurity issues. They want to be involved in the purchasing decision. Um, so, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's just become a, a lot more difficult to figure out what is act, actually working. 
Um, and that's why you kind of need to rely on somebody who has an idea of what does work um, and kind of the marketing mix that it does produce leads. Um, because, uh, you know, it, it's going to be hard to, to get that picture straight out of your analytics. Um, another thing that we've seen kind of to offset the decline in advertising is really the rise in content and SEO. Um, you know, obviously content and SEO has always been a part of the puzzle, but it's becoming increasingly so. Um, you know, you, you want to make sure that you're showing up on Google on the first page, ideally, for relevant searches in your market. Um, and we can talk a little bit about some of the ideas about how, how to go about doing that. Um, but it really starts with having good content and making sure that it's, it's, it's produced and it's communicating well for Google as well, not just your user base. Um, and then utilizing that content in a smart and intelligent way. Like, you know, um, we do, social media is not a big thing for a lot of MSPs, but if you're writing content, you should be putting it out there on social media. So you get some, a little bit of traction, you get some more eyeballs on it, you get the backlink and all that stuff. Um, you know, and same thing, if you're producing good content, you should be throwing it in a newsletter, uh, get it out there on, you know, maybe a quarterly or monthly basis to your clients. Um, cause content is hard to produce, especially quality content, whether you're doing it in-house or you're using an agency like eBridge to, to produce the content, uh, you know, it, it's costly. If you're doing it yourself, there's the opportunity cost of the time that you could be spending with your clients. Um, if you're using an agency and you want, uh, good quality content, you know, IT writers that, that are, um, you know, high quality are hard to come by and that, you know, they're, they're not cheap. So, um, you know, it's, you want to make sure that you're utilizing that content to its fullest. Yeah. And, um, so in terms of content strategy for MSPs, like, um, do you find it's easier to write, um, content for MSPs that are sort of targeting a specific niche of clients like legal or medical or something like that? Or, um, do you have success doing content that, that, um, gets attention for MSPs that are targeting a more broad sort of, uh, uh, base of customers. What, what, what's easier or what's more successful? Yeah, it's easiest to get results if you are focusing on a niche. Um, the biggest reason being is that there's less competition. Um, so, you know, with the example of uh, like a dentist office in particular, you know, it, it, the dentist office is going to identify more uh, with your content. Let's say, for instance, if you're making references to their patients, not their customers, you know, that's just going to re resonate more with them. Uh, maybe likewise, maybe making reference to, uh, you know, HIPAA compliance, right? You know, because you're dealing with, uh, you know, sensitive health data if you're in, in the United States. Um, and you can contrast that with, let's say, if you're working with, uh, you know, an, an e-commerce company, it's going to be more about financial compliance. Um, so, you know, those are the things that are really going to stick out uh, to, to the dentist or to the e-commerce company. Um, and it's going to make them feel like you're the one for them, right? It, there's a fit there. Um, you know, having said that, though, we do, you know, you do want to have some general information there, too. So what we tend to recommend is you have a services section. Um, so, you know, essentially one page for each main service that you offer. And that tends to be more for a general audience, right? And then you also want to have industry specific pages. So you would have a dentist page, an e-commerce page, et cetera, whatever your niche is. Uh, and then you want to make sure that uh, those pages are really focused in on the needs of, the, of that target market. Um, and then interlinking between the two. So make sure it's easy to find, you know, uh, uh, information about the services from the industry specific page. And then um, that way you can kind of cover both bases. Um, and it's also a good idea even to have industry specific imagery on these pages too. It's not just written content. Um, really the idea is making sure that those pages stick out in a, um, and uh, appear like they're a good fit for the target audience. Yeah, so there's like a sort of intuitive way that people feel out to potential companies if they're going to work for them culturally um, and, and you know, operationally and all that sort of stuff. So the more you can resonate with your target clients. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And um, yeah, about the mix of marketing tactics, tactics that you use to reach MSPs, I'd imagine that some people um, here are actually also reaching MSPs, um, marketing to them as we are at Support Adventure. So what um, what works in terms of that and um, how does that differ from MSPs marketing to uh, businesses they want to provide services to? Yeah, I love this question um, because there are a lot of similarities between, <clears throat> excuse me, between MSPs and marketing agencies. We're both service-based companies. Um, you know, for us internally, 
One of the big revelations in recent years is uh, social media and in particular Reddit. Um, you know, the MSP subreddit is vibrant. It's a very large community. And I think the thing that we've found really surprising about it is that there are decision makers on there. You, you, you can reach the owners of MSPs directly on Reddit. And it's a little bit funny because you'll be interacting with like, you know, some obscure username. Um, and, you know, I guess initially it was a little bit like, are we actually dealing with people who matter here? Like, who is this anonymous person behind this username? Um, but, you know, we started really digging into the MSP subreddit and trying to participate more a few years ago, and it has generated really good leads for us that have become good customers, long-term customers. Um, and, you know, it, I, I can talk a little bit about that subreddit in particular, because one thing about MSPs is, um, you know, I've heard that the expression that MSPs are allergic to advertising. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I just, they just hate being sold on things, um, largely because they are so um, overwhelmed with different offerings all the time. And, you know, also vendors have done some pretty sketchy things in the past, you know, like shilling and having shill accounts and fake reviews and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, MSPs are pretty good at sniffing that sort of stuff out. So on Reddit, we, we really have success when we are, um, we're forthright about who we are. So we don't hide the fact we're a marketing agency. Uh, we don't participate in discussions where we can't add value. <laughs> and then also uh, we, we do make sure that we participate in, in like marketing related discussions. Um, but, you know, sometimes it's not really, it's not necessary to reply to every post. Sometimes it's better to just send a private message to somebody if they had posted something. Um, it's kind of a little bit of a feel out game where, you know, you don't want to be in every single thread that has to do with your company or your industry. Um, but you can pick and choose your spots where there's a really good question where you can add a lot of value. Maybe somebody has asked a question that corresponds to a piece of content that you've already written where you've answered that question. Um, that would be a great time to post it. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the, MSP subreddit is really a gold mine, not only for generating leads, by the way, but also market research. I like, I don't know of another place where you can go on and find like unfiltered opinions about, you know, about your, you're probably about your company. You know, if you're working with a lot of MSPs, you're probably being discussed on there. Yeah, um, we are. Yeah. If mm -hmm. not, then your competitors are. Uh, so going on there and getting that unfiltered feedback is really, really huge. I mean, I think there's a parallel here because um, we're doing the staffing, the outsourced staffing. And um, yeah, basically our experience is that probably like marketing, um, it's an industry where lots of people are doing it uh, in a way that isn't incredibly satisfied, so satisfying for um, MSP owners, you know, like it's, it's low quality. So the marketing side is probably the same. And on these sort of channels, you have the people who are most willing to, uh, most willing to, actually do the research have a discussion they're they're like playing the field to see see what they can get and um once you start getting recommended in there it really helps and the other like um, more sort of like membership oriented peer groups are the same i don't know tell like um do you feel that we we've succeeded in like we've also done paid ads, ads on reddit and mm -hmm. has has that really helped us generally so i think yes and no so i uh... To tie everything what we're talking about up until this point, there's a lot of parallels between what you're saying, Devin, and what we do here at Support Adventure in terms of the marketing. I think the most important thing that we do is to get to know the customers that we're looking to reach. Um, for us, it's both MSPs on one side of the business and also technicians and uh, you know uh, people to work for the MSPs on the other side. And it's so important to understand who we're trying to target what they're interested in, as you mentioned, what kind of keywords they resonate with. And Reddit is a, is a really good place to be part of those organic conversations. And we've also tried uh, do, making some video ads on Reddit as well. Um, the good thing about Reddit ads is that you can you know, pay and it's going to be shown to uh, a large amount of people, much higher than what you would get organically. But the downside of it is that, yes, a lot of people are uh, kind of, you know, adverse to marketing. It doesn't work on them. They're not going to click it, even if it's something that interests them. Once they realize that it's a paid advertisement, that's going to deter them away from um, having any sort of interaction with it. Uh, but it's a numbers game at the end of the day. So even though we had probably a very low conversion rate that it's hard to measure, um, 
because it is hard to measure marketing these days. I think with the numbers game, we do we did get quite a few clients that mentioned that they saw us from a Reddit ad. So it's something to try. It's not you know the number one strategy I would recommend. Uh, we have a lot more success with organic SEO, definitely for our um, technician side because you know traveling and working is this niche that we found that's quite large, but also um, has so many opportunities within it, so many keywords that we can target to be shown on Google for, you know, working remotely in certain kind of countries or what kind of countries to go to at certain times of year to work remotely. Um, and coupling that with, uh, you know, working in IT is a very good opportunity for us that we've been uh, definitely taking advantage of. So, so yeah, to tie everything together, I think Reddit is an amazing platform and paid ads on Reddit are not quite as good, but still something to consider for most MSPs. I also yeah, think I it's important. Yeah, sorry. Um, I also think it's important to have a world of content that people can go once they find out about you somewhere like Reddit. You know, it's like I look at the our, our success in marketing. Um, basically, like the articles we write, the YouTube videos we make, and then the ads, and then the way that people find out about us, either through a conversation on Reddit or a sort of like, um, you know, a referral from a peer uh, in a peer group and all that sort of stuff. But then when people get into it, they can really see what the business is all, all about and without going through any sort of sales process, decide whether it's a fit for what they need. Um, whether we're culturally fit for their company. So I want to spin this around back to sort of like MSPs and and say say you were targeting the medical industry and you found a forum or something like that where people were discussing um, <clears throat> medical software, software that's, um, you know, they're using in their offices and in and, and, and their practices. What would be the best way to sort of go in there and sort of like uh, what's too pushy and what's what's like uh, and, and who would do that in your, in your case? Um, would you have people um, butting in there and, and talking about the MSP or would you um, train the MSP on how to do that? So um, the medical examples uh, um, is an interesting one. I, I would say, generally speaking, there's not as much opportunity on Reddit for MSPs. Uh, that, yeah. That's one contrast uh, compared to marketing, just because there isn't really, um, you know, a, a lot of the MSPs are targeted geographically, right? And yeah. yes, there are subreddits for every every municipality on Reddit but they're not really focused on say business owners in that municipality. Um, so you don't quite have the same um, level of, of, I guess, specification in, in terms of your target market. Uh, but say for the medical example, that, that is a good one. Um, and what I would recommend, and this is true, whether it's on Reddit or, you know, back in the day, we used to hear a little bit more about Spiceworks and this, those sorts of communities, but um, participate in the community before you do advertising. Yeah. If you're coming through with an advertising first approach, then it's going to come across kind of slimy. Um, but if you're, if you're actually participating, you're actually asking questions and you're adding value, maybe you're sharing your content that actually solves problems. And then you layer it on top of that with some ads to increase the brand awareness to kind of get another brand interaction. Um, then that's the way to go. Um, another tip I have too, is what we do is, you know, we use Slack internally for our communication and um, I have an IFTTT uh, integration where it pretty much searches the MSP subreddit. And anytime anyone mentions marketing or anything related, it gets posted in a Slack channel for us. So that it's a very easy way to kind of, you know, monitor that, uh, that subreddit and that community without actually having to, you know, be on there all the time, because it can be quite a time sink. Otherwise, if you're, if you're looking for these threads. Um, so, you know, that, that would be my advice is make sure you're participating in relevant threads before you're doing advertising. Otherwise it's not going to be effective. That's a great idea. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, uh, I think an another thing for, for us internally that we do share with MSPs for our marketing is just the focus on SEO content, uh, um, having a good website that represents you and very important word of mouth. Um, you know, MSPs is, you know, a lot of them, uh, every MSP, MSP I've ever talked to, their main source of leads is word of mouth and referrals. Um, you know, it's a reputation base. So uh, that's the same thing for, for us. But one thing that we've learned over the years is that word of mouth doesn't just happen in isolation. Let's say somebody gets a referral to you. Well, they're still going to Google you. They're still going to see your Google reviews. They're still going to see your website. They're going to check out your About Us page, see if your team is credible, 
all that stuff. Um, so you, you can't just rely on word of mouth uh, on its own. You do need to bring the whole marketing mix together in order to generate uh, good leads. And that's very much the same with us too. Yeah, that whole ecosystem of content and that sort of like, yeah, it's it's you want people to be sold before they even fill out a form on your website because your material should be that good that that they they believe in in what you do and who you are, right? Yeah, exactly. And and what the benefit will be for them if they if they fill out that form and, and see what's happening with you guys and yeah, yeah, get a, get a pitch. And then- in a digital world, that all happens, well, mostly on your website. That's another difference with us is we don't do a lot of like in-person um, marketing slash sales. We are, you know, a remote company and all that. So, you know, MSPs do more of that in-person stuff. Um, so making sure that all your, your sales collateral is aligned with your messaging on your website to, um, you know, simple things like have links to your website on your sales materials so people can find out more information, maybe have some testimonials that are both on your website and on your uh, your in-person sales materials. So um, just have a nice uh, um, collaborative and cohesive approach there. And, and what does... works, Go ahead. sorry, I was just going to say what works really well for us, for example, is that if you go on our website, you have many videos. We're a very video centric marketing uh, approach, or we have a video centric marketing approach. And so when clients are considering working with us or working for us, they realize uh, already who we are based on the videos that we have, what our personalities are, um, and what kind of company we are. The company culture can really seep through those videos. And I this think is, that works yeah. really well for us. Where This is what I don't see, yeah, on a lot of MSP pages. Yeah, like, yeah um, for sure. They, they just plaster it with like all sorts of like Microsoft logos and some stock photos and stuff like that. But, you know, like... I feel like a lot of them could do a lot better if they actually like put somebody on the camera who presents well and sort of talked about how hopefully the founder or CEO of the company, how, how they actually care about the needs of the business. They're there to help companies fulfill their business objectives because it's like, that's what everybody wants at the end of the day, to like fulfill their business objectives. Technology is just a means of getting there and the personality um, that pushes that through really like because I look at a lot of MSP websites and, and it gets so mundane because they look all the same, you know, like the business names can start to seem uninventive after you've seen hundreds of them. And and just like, I don't know, where does the, it all start putting together a good strategy to to sort of like um, avoid the the sort of to stick out, like to to avoid looking like just another MSP, they'll sign you up on a contract and where, where where do you start with that? And where do you guys, what do you require from a MSP before they work with you in terms of like branding and, and like um, offerings, unique offerings and stuff like that? And how do you take that um, if they've got it and turn it into a unique strategy or a effective strategy, I guess, more importantly? Yeah, you know, the, 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 what comes to mind when you're saying that is, you know, how many times do you go onto an MSP website and you see the same stock image of some beautiful person with a headset on, right? Like it's clearly not actually a tech person. Um, you know, that, that, that to me is just the, uh, you know, that's just, a, you're just going to blend in with everyone else if you're using kind of stock imagery. Yeah. Um, what, what I would recommend is actually promoting your team. Uh, what is unique about your team and tying into what you guys were saying about your videos, you know, um, that really can videos can really get across a lot of credibility um you know it, it makes you your personality get out there more um but also like images of your team too uh, one thing that we did internally over the pandemic uh was we wanted to promote our team on our website so we had caricatures drawn of our team and you know, put them into like a little zoom like setting and that's on our home page and you know each one of the caricatures has some sort of uh of a personal item in the background so my boss has a bike and Here i we have go. I have my uh, my hockey jersey on and Lisa has her coffee maker there. Lal has his laptop. So, you know, that that way it's, it just gets across a little bit more personality than than just uh, the stock image of a beautiful person. Um, the other thing I would say, too, is and we practice what we preach in this regard, too, is you don't really have to come uh, with a really fully full blown, fully thought out uh, marketing strategy off the bat. It can be iterative. 
Um, so, you know, for instance, we started with those caricatures and then we, we've grown to have them other places on our site. Uh, you know, I use my, my image on my, my social media. So, um, you know, you, you can start off with one idea, see what resonates with people and then grow with that. You don't have to kind of come out with, uh, with a perfectly laid out plan from the very beginning. And yes, you could go to a, like a, a branding shop, you know, get a professional branding shop to, you know, do you a really nice logo, some nice slogans, some nice brand statements, all that jazz. And there's nothing wrong with that, except for the fact that it's very, very expensive to do. And for most MSPs, um, and I can talk about the exceptions, but for most MSPs, branding is not the biggest component of the marketing. It doesn't really matter as much as it does in other industries. Um, the exception to that is if you are going after larger organizations, um, it does matter more because, uh, you know, there's so much competition for those larger organizations, you need to kind of differentiate yourself more. Uh, but if you're a smaller MSP, it, it's not, it, your, your dollar is better spent on content than it is on branded um because you're going to get more organic results that way and i've seen time and time again when i look at msps uh you know uh their analytics that um it's the organic traffic that performs the best um so that's why we tend to recommend it um and another thing just tying into the team is you know if you look at analytics almost always the most trafficked uh, page on a website is the home page but the second most trafficked page is the about us page. Um, so it really underscores how important it is to promote your team and what's unique about you. Um, and, you know, having like a nice integrated strategy is important to, um, you know, you, kind of what we already talked about, where if you're doing content, you know, you want to make sure you're posting on your blog, your newsletter. If you're doing, uh, you know, YouTube, you want to make sure it's nicely SEO optimized so people can find those videos. Uh, but it doesn't need to be perfectly aligned. We're, we're not going for like a masterpiece here. Um, you know, a, for instance, you could write a, a one-off blog that's a little bit, you know, let's say quirky or a little bit different. Or um, and, and if it's just something that interested you, it's no big deal to throw that out there on, on your website, even if it's not perfectly aligned with your, with your company's voice. Um, you know, it, it doesn't need to be a perfect. It really is okay to grow, to take chances and to let it grow uh, iteratively. Cool. And um, right. So how would you compare yourself with the other marketing agencies in the field of uh, the MSP specialities? Um, like, do they tend to provide the same sort of services and the same standard of service? And how, if you were an MSP owner, how, I mean, how would you choose which marketing company is actually going to be the right fit for for um, you as an MSP owner and is actually going to deliver results? Yeah, so there's kind of two categories of marketing agencies that I see. Um, and I, I don't think um, it, I don't think necessarily one is better than the other. It's just kind of a matter of what's the best fit for the individual MSP. But the, the categories I see are you have companies who are offering like templated marketing materials. So, you know, everyone gets the same website, everyone gets the same content and blogs, the same newsletters, uh, newsletter templates. Um, and there's, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, it comes obviously at a, a lower cost, but the risk you run is that you aren't going to differentiate yourself. Um, and, you know, especially if you're in a large uh, municipality um, where there's a lot of competition from other MSPs, having that generic content isn't going to be the best bet. Uh, you might even have competition in the same market who's using the same content, right? So not only is that confusing to Google, um, but for a client who's doing research, you're not going to come across credible if you if they've also seen uh, an MSP with the same content. So you know that that is kind of the the lower cost and uh, option, and it does make sense and it's good value for a lot of smaller MSPs. But then if, if you do want to grow and you want to go after larger organizations and you want a unique, unique content, um, you know, a unique website that actually speaks about what your company is all about, um, then, it, you know, you're going to work with an agency who is making unique content for you, obviously, and that comes at an increased cost. Um, so it kind of depends where the, where the MSP is at in their growth cycle. Um, but the biggest thing I would recommend is to make sure you find an agency or a marketing company who has an industry focus in IT service providers. Uh, we've worked with countless uh, companies who, you know, started off working with a generalist marketing agency, uh, maybe someone they know locally or, um, you know, through their network. 
And the problem is that this is a very unique market. Uh, what works for for you know B two C companies does not work for MSPs. Definitely, um, yeah. you, you know, there's going to be more of a focus on social media, uh, you know, Instagram stuff like that. That you know does work for other industries that just isn't really relevant here. Um, so, you know, making sure that you, you talk to, um, a, an agency that understands the lingo, um, the acronyms, the vendors, and kind of the unique aspects of marketing, um, managed services is, is probably the most important thing, even more important than, than the price point. Yeah. And, um, in terms of doing that custom sort of look of, of your MSP, um, if you're targeting most let's just generalize most business to business clients. What tends to work better, a more corporate sort of branding or a more sort of like people centric selling your staff? I think I know the answer from your previous, but um, you know, like lots of MSPs go for that corporate. We're, you know, like uh, WaveNet and we uh, will, we've got these uh, partnerships with Microsoft and stuff like that. And it's, it's hard to differentiate that, but um, yeah, what, What's the benefit of more corporate branding? Will that help you get bigger clients? Or if you're a really small business, obviously you'd want to go for people-centric branding to connect with that small business ethos. But uh, can you just compare the two approaches to like um, the the way? Because yeah, it tends to be those two that I see the most. So my perspective on this is that if you're going for the more corporate branding, um, then it's just really, really difficult to differentiate yourself. Um, and the reason being is that... Uh, most MSPs make the same marketing claims, offer the same services. Uh, you know, it's really hard to differentiate yourself kind of on um, the, the types of things that you would put forward in a corporate sort of a, a branding scenario. Um, so I, I would recommend a people centric approach, regardless of kind of the size of your MSP and the size of clients you're going after. Um, you know, obviously, if you're if you're a larger company going after larger clients, then um, you know maybe you're going to have to promote uh, you know, um, more of your more people on your website. But I would still focus on that and, and really try to find what's uh, what's unique about your your team as well. Um, you know, it's not just enough just to put yourself up there with a photo. Like, what is it that you like to, in your personal life? Uh, what is unique about your qualifications and your team's qualifications? Those are the sorts of things that you want to get out there. Um, that's going to resonate way more with B2B, a B2B audience than just the standard corporate branding that uh, that looks boring and that we're all familiar with. Yeah. Do you know any any specific examples of a of a company that used a people centric approach in a way that worked well? Um, yeah, one that comes to mind, not in the MSP space, but um, um, an infrastructure as a service provider is Liquid Web. Um, they have uh, um, their their tagline is they have the most um, helpful humans in hosting, and you know on their website they have p their actual staff uh, featured throughout the website. Um, and in my opinion, it makes them look quite credible. Uh, you know, these are going back to the beautiful people with headsets on. That that's not what they have. It's like these are Here real people. You can tell. This is it, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so you've got somebody who actually looks like a real person who probably works there is wearing the T-shirt of the company. And, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, they have a 25 years logo, which yeah. shows credibility as well. Yeah. And, you know, hosting is similar to MSPs in that, or an infrastructure service rather, um, in that it's just, uh, it's, it's hard to differentiate your brand. Uh, so I really like how they've leaned into that helpful humans in hosting. Um, and, and, and you see it throughout their marketing, not only on their website, uh, but uh, throughout, uh, you know, their sales materials and everything too. That's great. Yeah, it's, I mean, business is in the end always humans. And I, I think so many people have become so frustrated with the increasingly faceless um, corporate world, especially <laughs> when you're calling up something like a bank, um, when they've like flagged a credit card transaction and you're on hold for a while and you just have no um, predictability um, with the process that you're going to actually be going when you dial that number. And I think what MSPs need to promise their clients is some sort of consistency. All right, you're going to email it a ticket and you'll get like um, a response. You'll get a call from us within an hour or you're going to call and then we're going to create a ticket and prioritize it. And if it's really urgent, we'll get someone on, on immediately making those sorts of promises. But it's hard to make those promises if um, you're not presenting them as humans helping humans, you know, because yeah, the, I mean, I feel, I, I really love working with MSPs as a, 
staffing company and consultation for operations um, because um, ultimately they're selling IT support and that's a very human thing. Whereas like, um, as I've dabbled in, in stuff like um, software support and stuff like that, ultimately they're selling software and support is a side piece. So having like uh, MSPs really being people oriented and being a staffing uh, company has been really satisfying because you can actually, you know, talk to the MSPs, talk about their clients, talk about what they love about their clients, and then find people who fit fit that. So, people and and the culture that people bring um, is is just so important. And any MSP that's not portraying their team, um, it's it's like uh, your most valuable asset is is that basically the structure you've set up and the people who are inhabiting the, stru the structure to deliver great support and great infrastructure projects and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, that's great. Now, um, in terms of the analytics and stuff like that, um, what are the most important marketing metrics and KPIs that MSPs uh, should be watching in terms of uh, their marketing funnels and, and their sales process? Yeah, so you know, as I mentioned, it's becoming more and more difficult to track uh, over over the years here. Um, but the the low hanging fruit that we always recommend is contact form fills and phone calls from your website. Mm -hmm. um, those are the biggest ones, and you should set up conversions within your Google Analytics uh, to to track those things, and so you can figure out where those are coming from. Um, and for phone calls in particular, there are some third party tools you can use uh, to you know you can. Uh, kind of how they work is they'll they'll show a unique phone number on the website and they kind of rotate those through. Um, so if someone cl you know clicks on that unique phone number to initiate a call, um, you can track that conversion back to a specific source. Um, so we, we recommend those two definitely. Those are the most important. Um, but some other ones that that matter are kind of the bucket of in, in engagement metrics. So the, these are basics too. But time on site, bounce rate, and pages per session. Um, and, you know, for those metrics, what's considered good varies depending on your website, but as a very general rule of thumb, you know, time on site, you want to be in the two minute range, uh, more than two minutes is great uh, for a bounce rate, you probably want to be less than about 70% bounce rate, um, um, you know, lower is obviously better um, and pages per session, you know, you want it to be around two as well. Um, and it, it does vary because let's say if you have a homepage, it's very descriptive. Maybe people don't need to visit other pages on your website to get what they want. So, you know, the pages per session would be lower time on site might be lower too, but as a very general kind of, uh, um, you know, general rule of thumb, those would be some good numbers to look at, but you know, all those three, the contact form fills, phone calls, and the engagement metrics, um, those are the, the basics and we stick to the basics again, because it, doing the advanced tracking, it, it's difficult, it's expensive, and it's not even that accurate. So, um, you know, sticking to the basics makes a lot of sense at this point in time. Yeah. Tell any questions on that? No, no, that makes sense. I agree completely. Uh, yeah. we, we look at the same metrics as you do. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, and it's really satisfying to see it grow, especially like with the content, that uh, stuff that you put out there is actually being picked up by Google, put in front of relevant people, and and you're getting um, you're getting actual people who are interested yeah, in your and, business from that. Yeah, and people who might be new to SEO or to content marketing need to realize, of course, as we all know, that it takes time. It could take four to six months, if not more, for new pages to actually uh, you know reach the first page on Google if they ever will. Um, it's definitely more of a long term strategy. So I do see some people, you know, making 10 blog posts, waiting a month and then freaking out because they don't get any traffic coming from it um, without realizing that, you know, SEO and content marketing is very much a long term approach and should be coupled with other, um, you know, marketing strategies that are more immediate if they need something, you know, right now, let's say in theory. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. And a tip I would have for MSPs or really any company is search your search Google for a key phrase that is really important to your business, and then take stock of what's on the first page of Google, um, especially in terms of uh, actual companies. So like you know not like a business listing or anything like that, you know, but actual companies that might be your competitors. And then take a look at 
how long is that content? Like how, like, is it like 2000, 3000 words? Um, Cause if so, you know, you need, you need to kind of uh, have a, uh, a similar approach, a similar amount of content on your website in, in all likelihood. And if you want to rank on the first page of Google, um, take a look at what headlines they have and what sub, sub headlines they have. And not that you should copy them exactly, uh, but there might be uh, some key phrases in there that would uh, give you some hints about you know, what you should include in your own piece. And then it really is a quality over quantity thing. Um, and it goes back to what you were saying, Tal, uh, where, you know, if, if it's not going to have results for, for several months, um, but it is going to stay up there for a long time, it makes sense to invest the time into it to make it a really good piece. Um, you know, especially if it's a, a really super important keyword for you, uh, you might want to start with the goal of trying to make the best piece on, on that particular topic that's online uh, and, and make it the same length as, as your competitors, but the quality is better. And then that's going to give you a really good chance of, of ranking on Google. Um, and then, of course, you want to SEO optimize the content as well uh, and to make sure that, you know, you have all the things that Google wants to see for that uh, page so that, you know, it's not only resonating with your target audience, but it's resonating with Google as well. Yeah. And on that and um, on that note, actually, I'm just thinking uh, you mentioned how geographically specific MSPs are. You know, a lot of them are providing um, in-person services, for example, in a city. How geographically specific should a uh, MSP's marketing be? Like if they're located in Vancouver, should they have Vancouver on every single page, on every single post in titles? Uh, like, Is that something that MSPs should really be focusing on for their keyword research? I would say so. Um, you do need to worry about uh, what they call keyword cannibalization. Uh, so if you have really strong keyword presence on, let's say, two different pages on your website, they're actually going to be competing against each other. Mm -hmm. um, so you kind of want to have one page, which is the authority on your website, and then you can sprinkle in those geographic keywords on other pages too. But let's say for the example of Vancouver, um, and we practice what we preach here, we have a, a Vancouver MSP marketing services uh, landing page or, uh, that we, we have set up on our website. And, you know, it does have some information that's kind of redundant, especially with regards to like our services pages. Um, Cause you know, it, it's meant for people who are searching for Vancouver MSP marketing so they can land on that um, and get an idea of our services or company, et cetera, kind of a quick overview of everything. Um, but, you know, uh, having one web page like that, and you can almost like template it too, where you have at the very top of the page, you have like a paragraph that's specific to that city, make some references to local attractions or whatever it is, right? Um, and then down below, you can kind of have the, the same content that you re reuse for every municipality that describes your services and a little bit about your company. Um, so you can create a bunch of pages pretty quickly like that. And what we recommend is don't put those pages in the navigation because uh, they are redundant. Um, they're going to, you know, if someone's just browsing your website, who's come to your homepage, um, you know, it, there's not much value to them to click through a bunch of different municipality pages that have a lot of, of overlap. Of but you can put them in your footer um, and, you know, you can still make them indexable. So, so search engines, you know, can send people to them, but I wouldn't recommend putting them in your navigation just so it's a cleaner experience from, for the user. Yeah. So there was uh, something um, that I wanted to mention about YouTube is um, yeah. YouTube videos are really powerful, especially of um, someone in the business who has a, a great amount of um, informational authority on on the subjects that are going and when what with uh support adventure one thing that we did is we actually had me myself the founder of the company who knows a lot about msp stuff i made videos about msp stuff and then what we did um with the videos is we got um article articles made by the content writing team and so that they would have a little bit more um natural flow of information and and sort of like um stuff like that so the example for msps would be like yeah let's stick with vancouver um if i was in vancouver i would and um and i was a msp owner i might make a video that um was about what's the best business i uh, isp in in vancouver where should you get your business internet or what's the best uh cell phone uh provider for 4G for Vancouver businesses and stuff like that. And then you have that as a YouTube video, and then you have an article made out of that. And then that ranks at SEO. And at the top of the article, if people want to click, they can watch the video and stuff like that. Have you have you seen any MSPs um, have useful results um, combining um, 
video and YouTube uh, SEO with um, the articles and stuff like that? Is this something that's uh, that's you think is, would be effective if people would try it? Yeah, I think so. Um, YouTube is the second biggest search engine in the world. Um, and the SEO for YouTube is uh, kind of its, its own animal, I, sh I should say. And, you know, there's, there's little things you can do to make sure your videos are SEO optimized. Like uh, I'm sure you guys have seen on YouTube how they have uh, what they call chapters. So, you know, if you scroll over oh, yeah. the, play, the play bar, you can see kind of the different subjects at different times throughout the video. Um, not, again, not only is that good for the user experience, uh, but that's keywords that Google is going to draw on. And they know that specific segment of the video is very, you know, highly targeted to those keywords that are in the title of the chapter. And that shows up in the search engine, not only on YouTube, but on Google as well. Um, so making sure that you have, you know, that set up, you have all your descriptions set up uh, for each video, um, that's huge. And then tying it back into the other marketing tactics, as you're alluding to there, Eric, is, you know, if you're going to go to the effort of putting together a, a well thought out video, why not turn that into some text content as well uh, for your website? And there's a couple different ways to do that. You could just like, say, take the same headings and, you know, the same ideas and, and write a unique blog on it. Um, but, you know, for some MSPs, they might not have enough time to do that, enough resources. So another little trick you can do is just transcribe the video. Um, and then, you know, you, you have like an automated transcription and there might be some errors in there and things. You start but you from can, there, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you can start from there, have a little disclaimer saying this is a machine generated transcription. And then for the blog, at the top of the blog, you just embed the video and then you have the transcription down below. And, and what I've found is that... Um, I, an hour of content produces about 10,000 words. And not that I suggest doing an hour long video for, for each video that, that you know, takes a lot of attention to get through that. But the point being that if you're to write 10,000 words on your own um, or to hire someone to write 10,000 words, that is a huge undertaking, way, way more difficult than just speaking for an hour. Um, having said that, if you check your YouTube analytics, um, at least for us, what we find is that people kind of, there's, there's, there's diminishing returns after about 10 minutes. People really watch the first 10 minutes of a video and then they start to trail off. Um, so, you know, sometimes it might be more cost effective to, to focus on shorter videos, or maybe you break them up a little bit more. Um, but that's a little bit of an individual decision. And I don't think that you need to really hyper-focus on the length of the video. It's really how, how long it takes to get uh, the, the points that you want to get across, uh, across. Um, and uh, that's probably more important than the length, but uh, it is good to be aware that sometimes it's better use of time to make the shorter videos. Yeah. And, yeah, and if you can we be concise, a, yeah, go ahead. We have a great example of what we did, which I could show for everybody interested uh, in their own marketing strategies. So we have um, best practices guide, for example, where we have many videos um, which were then turned into information with the heading, something that's, you know, easy to look at easy to skim through, um, including there's some charts here and some, uh, you know, example ticket notes, things like that. So taking a piece of content, having, uh, you know, reading all of the information in it or listening to all the information in it and then organizing it works really well. And then also once you have a whole bunch of different uh, videos and articles, making something like a knowledge hub, that's what we decided to call it, where you list off all of the videos and your blog posts that you have, and then organize it for different categories that are important for the industry that the MSP is looking for. For example, we have software management, scaling, documentation, communication, et cetera, where people can easily find all of these um, you know, blog posts organized based on very specific um, categorizations that are important. That's also another great way. Um, and a lot of these actually started as videos, which then got turned into articles, which then got turned into, you know, a piece of the puzzle on this knowledge hub. Yeah, so it's because all very I'm not going to. Yeah, I'm not going to sit there and write these articles, but I, I enjoy sitting in front of the camera and having a conversation about these topics. And yeah, I think I think like rather than you have to engage your staff at producing the con content. Like uh, the people who most know your clients and their needs will produce content um, that will most attract the types of clients that you want to have uh, come on board. And if you can make a resource like this, like a, a business IT guide for Vancouver that's local and relevant and actually has like a lot of information, then I guess the algorithms on YouTube would start to see your, your site as not just another marketing thing, but an actual resource that people are going to engage with, you know, so. 
Yeah, you know, 100%. Um, yeah, and, and I, I think that um, another thing to consider too is if, if you're going for like a search engine optimization strategy, people are always anxious when there's a, a Google algorithm update, right? Because it's, oh, my, are my <laughs> rankings going to fall? The best way to insulate yourself from that is by doing what Tal, kind of what you just mentioned is write quality content um, and do the basics, like have good interlinking, make it easy to find, um, you know, have those headings and everything. Do the things that Google wants you to do. And then when there is a, a Google algorithm update, it's just no sweat. Um, you know, mm -hmm. the, this it's you're going to keep performing. You're probably not going to see a, a downtick in traffic. And if anything, you're going to see an uptick. And um, tying into what we were talking about with choosing a marketing agency earlier, if you are going after one, or sorry, if you are working with one of those uh, marketing agencies that offers, uh, you know, the templated sort of blogs and websites and everything, what we've seen is that the blog entries, uh, they'll actually have no index tags on them quite often because you, you, the, there's, there would be duplicate content penalties if you have the exact same blog as 100 other companies online. Google is actually going to dock you marks for that. Um, so how these agencies that are lower cost get around that is making it so um, you know, they signal to the search engines, hey, don't come read this page. Well, of course, that kind of, you know, that's that's a bummer because we're not only writing blogs for for people, but we're writing blogs for Google. So it, you know, it, it takes away that that big part of that uh, that component right there, um, and it's something to be mindful of. And, and again, it's not to say that you shouldn't have templated blogs because it definitely has a place for smaller MSPs. Um, but if you are at stage of growth where you're looking to kind of you know get more sophisticated, then you want to make sure that uh, that they are ranking correctly, and it, that starts with making sure that Google can actually read the page. And sorry, what would be the benefit of a smaller MSP taking a copy paste template and having it? Do you think clients would read that and see value in the MSP, even if it's a template that can be found time and time again? Yeah, you know, I do think there is some value in terms of like education um, and, you know, people can get information about your services. Um, let's take a stereotypical example of like of an Office 365 blog. Um, you know, you can have a, a blog that talks about MS Teams or whatever, best practices for MS Teams. Those tips are still going to have value for the user, um, but not from an SEO perspective, uh, you know, and if they were to take that uh, templated blog and put it into Google and, you know, the, the headline or whatever, and, you know, it, your, your page isn't even going to show up. So there is some value to the user, but uh, it, it's not going to do anything for the search engine. And it's not going to do anything to separate your brand as being unique. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so what what kind of investment do you think is reasonable for, let's say, an MSP successful, you know, in the millions of uh, US dollars ARR um, sort of level? What do you think is a good, when engaging a marketing agency like yours, what's a good sort of um, 360 that will cover all the bases? What's an investment per month that they would have to commit to to actually get, um, you know, all of these pieces in place to make a nice uh, strategy? So it varies a lot depending on internal factors, like how many resources they have in house, um, how how uh, well established they are already, you know, um, with their with their marketing presence. But as a general rule of thumb, I would say at a minimum about twenty five hundred dollars a month. Um, if you're working with a marketing agency that needs to bring in multiple resources from their team, an SEO person, content writer, um, you know, web designer, et cetera, then you know, that gives enough flexibility to bring in multiple resources and get, you know, the, the integrated approach done. Um, and then on the, uh, the high end, you know, if you want to start mixing in like lead generation tactics or, um, in, in, or advertising, we haven't talked too much about Google ads yet. Um, you know, it'd probably be closer to maybe $10,000 a month or more. Um, Google ads in particular, if you're in a large, um, metro area can eat through a lot of budget, uh, quite quickly. Um, and, you know, we talked about how digital advertising isn't that, uh, big of a factor compared to nine years ago, but Google ads is a little bit of an exception. Um, people still go on Google to find what they're looking for to do the research and everything. Um, so it pays to be there and to have advertising there. Um, but you need to be really selective because especially in large metro regions, the cost for keywords could be $15, $20 per, per click, if not more. Um, and when you start doing the math about, okay, how many of those clicks need to convert into leads? And, you know, I, I would say of an MSP who's doing really well, it would be like 5% 
uh, conversion rate to get to get a lead from a click. Um, so let's say, you know, um, so let's say we're doing $25 per click and a 5% conversion. Well, that's a $500 per lead, uh, per lead charge um, or cost rather. So, you know, for, for a lot of MSPs, that's going to be difficult math to work with. It might make sense for larger MSPs where you're going after an organization that has more end users. Therefore, you know, that lead is worth more to you. The math does work out. But if you're going after, let's say, a 10 to 20 man uh, SMB, the math doesn't really work out there. So you need to be really selective and making sure that you're going after the right type of keywords. Um, talking about Office 365, again, that would be an example of, of a, a keyword that would be really hard to go after because there would be a ton of competition, not only from MSPs, but from other businesses too, right? Um, so, you know, sticking to things like at the very least, you should have branded keywords uh, in your Google ads, um, um, you know, and that's not going to have a great deal of search volume either. So the cost isn't too high, but it really does have an impact on your conversion rate and insulates you from competitors going after your branded keywords. Um, so that at the very minimum is a good idea. And then going after some long tail keywords too, uh, where they're more focused on your specific offering, whether it's, we talked about dentists. So maybe, you know, at, um, adding the, the word dentist to some, some long tail keywords or, or your, your metro region, to some long tail keywords and to make it more specific, that's going to bring the cost per, per click down and make the math a little bit more tenable. Um, but, uh, you know, if, if you are doing advertising on, on Google, then it does require, um, uh, you know, ongoing management. Um, it's tough to do Google ads in this industry, you know, even though it is important, it's challenging. So there's the cost of managing it too. And you want to have someone experienced managing it. Um, and then there's the actual ad spend, which is significant as well. Yeah. Um, is remarketing useful where where like they've been to your website and then the sort of thing keeps on popping up on their google ads does that is that sensible to employ i i like remarketing if it's done tactfully um, you, don't, <laughs> okay. you, you know there's there's uh, um, a setting called uh, frequency cap which is essentially how often somebody is going to see your ads and, you know, and you don't want to have that frequency cap uh, out of control. Um, you know, like if someone sees your ads 20 times, you know, that's probably plenty. Um, you know, they're, they're going to ignore it a, a, at least half the time. <laughs> so, you know, in their mind, they might've seen it 10 times, which might seem like it's even a little bit too aggressive, but um, you know, the reality is you're trying to get leads. You're not trying to make friends. Um, you know, obviously you want to be respectful, but you do have to put yourself out there a little bit if you want to generate leads, but you want to do so reasonably. Um, another thing too, with remarketing, um, you know, you can do it through a bunch of different platforms. Uh, but what, the one that we really like is remarketing through YouTube with video ads. Um, you know, it's just, it's engaging. It's more interesting than just a, a, a you know, a banner up there. Um, and, you know, people tend not to skip YouTube ads as much and you can kind of have different ad units that, uh, you know, you can have longer videos on there or you can have that where people can skip them or you can have shorter ones where they can't. Um, so yeah, doing it through YouTube is a good way to get that, uh, that re-engagement with them in a way that's more meaningful than just like a banner ad or something like that. But I do like remarketing though, because remarketing, you're reaching people who've already visited your site or maybe they've already watched your video um, and you can do some cool things like you can remarket people who have watched, let's say, at least 75% of one of your YouTube videos. Um, you know, that's obviously going to be somebody who's familiar with your brand more so than just somebody who comes and like visits your site really quickly. Um, so you can be tailored with it too. But, uh, you know, just you, you want to be, uh, you want to avoid the, the perception that you're just spamming people with ads, okay. especially if they're annoying ads that uh, kind of flash or whatever. Like, you don't, you don't want that. You want something that comes across credibly like a YouTube video. Great. Um, well, I, I, I think that's a, that's a lot of information that people will be digesting after watching this. So thanks a lot for your time today. Um, we're going to put the uh, link to eBridge in, in the description of this video. And um, I'm sure um, you'll be happy to hear from some people who watch this and already know about what you're doing. So thanks a lot for your time today. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Tal. Yeah. And if anyone has any questions on what we discussed or any questions specifically to their MSPs marketing, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. We're always happy to jump on a phone call and, uh, and to have a discussion. Great. Well, thanks for appearing on MSP Mountain. Take care. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks, guys.